Um, so we're wrapping up this sermon series. We have spent six weeks, well, five weeks, talking about hospitality, a hospitality that is generous and a hospitality that is gracious. And my hope and my prayer is that that has begun to kind of seep in to your life and you're paying attention uh, to kind of what is happening around you. The sermon title today is Don't Miss Out. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that. Next Sunday, we do begin our new sermon series uh, for the season of Lent, which we're calling Prophet, Priest, and King. And we're looking at the three offices. I'm trying not to get too theological here this morning. We'll save that for next Sunday. Um, there's three offices in the Old Testament, office of prophet, office of, office of priest, and office of king. And they're all, each of those are filled by individuals. But when Jesus arrives, he fulfills all of those. He is the ultimate prophet. He is the ultimate high priest. He is the great high king. And so what we want to do is look at some of those images that appear to us in Old and New Testament texts to see how Christ is the fulfillment, that everything comes to its fruition. Everything that the Old Testament points to is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, born to die so that we might have life. So that's what we're going to be looking at next week. But for the past several weeks, we have been talking about this idea of hospitality, how we make others feel. As Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you do, but they will remember how they feel. They'll remember how they felt in your presence. And I think when I think about what, how I know that I have been successful at practicing a generous and gracious hospitality is that there's a sense that the other person feels as though they are seen as though they are known, as though they are loved. And that is ultimately, I think, the goal of what our Christian, our believing hospitality is to be all about. But we have this problem. You know, even in our church's vision statement, we say we want to experience the transforming love of Jesus and we want to express it. So you can come in this morning and you can be, you know, amazingly encouraged by the music and the message and everything that you're going to encounter this morning. You're going to experience that. But we as a church say you then need to go out and express that. That it is in the living of our faith that, that we come to life, that others come to life, that others come to know of the love of Jesus. But there is this problem. And the problem is we forget. We forget. It's not necessarily intentional, but we just don't remember. We don't recall. We don't recollect all it is that God has done for us and this, this hospitality that he calls for us to have for others. And so God, throughout the scriptures, reminds us, even in the book of Leviticus, Okay, I know you guys, anyone reading through Leviticus right now? All the nice laws of the, the Old Testament. And, but it's fascinating. In the book of Leviticus, God is saying, remember the hospitality I showed to you. This is Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. We read this. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born, Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When there is a stranger in your midst, when there is a foreigner in your midst, where there is someone you don't necessarily recognize in your midst, show them hospitality because God says, guess what I did to you? When you were enslaved in Egypt, I extended my love and I extended my grace to you. And then I brought you to a place. I gave you a space. I showed you hospitality. And the reason for this, he says, I am the Lord your God. That's it. There is no other reason for that. But if you read through Leviticus chapter 19, you don't have to do that right now, but at a later date, you go back 12 times in Leviticus chapter 19, God says, I am the Lord, your God. He gives them a rule. He gives them a regulation. And he says, the reason is this, I am God. I showed you original hospitality. I welcomed you when you were an outsider, when you were a stranger, and I brought you home. In very much the same way, that is how we are to live, to practice hospitality. And so our text that we're going to start with this morning, we're not going to spend much time here, actually comes out of the book of Hebrews. We're we're bookending Hebrews the next two Sundays, although we're starting with the end of the book instead of the beginning of the book, which is a little strange, I recognize. This morning, we're in Hebrews 13. Next Sunday, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1. So just... 
letting you know I'm aware of what's coming down the road in case you think to yourself, oh, we're looking at Hebrews twice in a row. Yes, we are. Hebrews chapter 13, verse one and two. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And then this phrase, what does it say? Do not, you all were very quiet. Do not forget. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Do not forget to show hospitality. We've talked about this before. That is the Greek word philozenia. It means the love of the outsider, the love of the stranger. We know the word xenophobia. Yes, the fear of the stranger, right? That's a literal Greek transliteration, I guess that is. Um, for us, is a word that we use as xenophobia, is the fear of the stranger. But this word is philozenia, which is the love of the stranger. And the preacher of Hebrews says, do not forget to show hospitality to the outsider, to the one who is different, to the one who doesn't quite fit. Because when you do that, you might just be entertaining angels. You might just be entertaining God and you are completely unaware of it. Don't forget. And so the reference here, and you may recall this story, it goes back to Genesis chapter 18 to the story of Abraham and Sarah. So I want to spend a little bit of time kind of unpacking some of this story this morning. We're going to read the first five verses of Abraham, of Genesis, come back and talk about that a little bit, and then we're going to look, skip down to verse nine. The Lord appeared to Abraham, verse one of Genesis 18, near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So if you know how this story goes, Abraham, who's married to Sarah, goes into Sarah and says, hey, we have guests. I've brought water for their feet so they might wash their feet, an act of hospitality. Sarah, would you make some bread? I'm going to go kill the calf, and we're going to prepare a meal for them and extend hospitality. This was expected in the days of Abraham. This was expected, as we talked about, in the days of Jesus, to extend hospitality and welcome to a stranger or to an outsider who happened to be making their way. And so that's what happens. Abraham prepares a meal, Sarah does some baking, and all of a sudden these strangers are being entertained and being hosted. We never know, as we're going to discover in this story, who we are inviting out. We never know who it is that might be sitting next to us today that we need to invite out for coffee. We just never know. So the story of Abraham and Sarah. You may recall back in the book of Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham and God creates a covenant with Abraham, has a conversation with Abraham saying, I'm going to make you great. Your name will be great. You will bless others. You will be blessed. And all these promises to Abraham of this eventual family that he is going to have but there is a huge problem because that happens back in Genesis chapter 12. And guess what is happening by Genesis chapter 18? Abraham is old. Sarah is old. And they have no child. How in the world is God going to keep his promise? And you have to wonder how Abraham and Sarah are feeling at that moment. Would God really keep his promise? Had Abraham wandered from the faith? 
had Sarah wondered, had they begun to wonder, would God really fulfill his promise? It'd been many years. And I suspect many of us would have begun to wonder and perhaps to even find our faith wandering, wandering away from the living God. Would God really show up? So then we're going to skip a couple of verses in Genesis 18. Skip down to verse 9. So after they've eaten, we have this conversation. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked Abraham. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard? Now, I want to make a comment about this word. Sometimes as we've talked about translations, um, where is that word up there? Anything too hard. That Hebrew word is literally the word wonderful. Okay, you can go check it out. Go look it up. Wonderful, extraordinary, or marvelous. So when the NIV translates this, and the NIV is not the only one that is to blame for this, um, it is not quite accurate, and it's unfortunate. Well, it's unfortunate for the illustration I'm going to make in my sermon anyway, in just a few minutes, okay? But I want you to notice that because I'm going to go back to that Hebrew understanding of is anything too wonderful rather than is anything too hard for the Lord, okay? So just a little little note on that. So uh, why does Sarah laugh? Well, I really have a child now that I'm old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, and so she lied and said, I did not laugh. And I love that this is just here in Scripture. But he said, yes, you did laugh. (laughs) Do not think that you can fool the Lord, okay, my friends? And you can have all the conversations and iterations that you would like to have with the Lord, and he's still going to know the truth. But I think about that initial laugh of Sarah. It is a laugh born out of hopelessness. She is barren. Her and Abraham have not been able to conceive. She is broken. There's the whole story of Hagar as well, which I don't, and Ishmael, which I don't have time to get into this morning. Her laugh is a laugh of despair perhaps even cynical. How will she ever be able to conceive? But what had God done? God showed up in the trees of Mamre, in the heat of the day, through the encounter of these strangers. God is suddenly present. And I love that image that it's like, it's the worst time of the day to show up. Abraham's just trying to stay cool. And trust me, man, I know what it's like to try and stay cool in the middle of the summer. I grew up in Fresno, like, right? I mean, I know what what he's saying. And if you can find any shade, you are just ecstatic that you can find some sort of shade. And Abraham's just trying to stay cool. And all of a sudden, these three strangers come by. And he doesn't realize, and Sarah doesn't realize, who it is that they are hosting the surprise that is in store. Because God says something wonderful is going to happen. You know, we talk about this and we say that the church needs to be about those who wander and those who wonder. And that can be said from kind of a positive perspective and kind of a negative perspective. And what is happening with Sarah? She has wandered. Abraham has wandered. But they've also wandered. Is God's promise really true? And then they offer some hospitality. 
And God says, something wonderful is going to happen. You're going to have a child. And as we know how this story goes, that is exactly what happens. And so then we skip over to Genesis chapter 21, verse 6. After the birth of Sarah and Abraham's son, we read this. As she names her child Isaac, which means laughter. And we read this. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. She little, literally names that baby laughter, like that's what Isaac means. Because what did she do when God said, you're going to have a baby? She laughed. And God says, you need to name that kid laughter. But I want to take this in a little bit of a different direction. Because I believe that when we have these encounters with God, that when we extend hospitality, that one of the gifts of the extension of hospitality is laughter, is actually joy. Like God doesn't tell us to be hospitable just to tell us to be hospitable. God knows that something happens in those encounters when we are with others. And you think about this, when you have people over, when you are with friends, when you go out to coffee with somebody, when you reminisce, when you talk about the faith, when you do whatever, whatever it is that that might happen, there is just this simple delight and joy. There is laughter. It's like this holy laughter, right? There's nothing better. You all know exactly what it is that I am describing because you've been in those moments, you've been in those places, you've been in those conversations, you've shared those meals where all of a sudden, like it's just the spirit of God is just moving and you're like, and it's not like you're having an altar call at this moment, okay? Like that's great too. If you wanna have an altar call, I'm all for that. That's all good with me. But there's just something holy that's happening and it's this joy. I want to suggest this morning as we wrap up this series that that is another gift of hospitality. It is the joy and laughter that we get to experience. Sarah says, everyone who hears about this will laugh with me, will be delighted with me. You see, we make this journey. We're always on a journey. We're always on the move. We're always headed someplace. And that's why I love the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, those those beautiful Psalms that are written for the nation of Israel to sing as they go to Jerusalem. Three or four times a year, they're making their way to the holy city to worship God. Because remember in that day and age, the temple was where the residence of God was. And so they would sing these songs. Psalm 126 Love how this describes it. We read these words, the first three verses of Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Now notice, when God restored the fortunes, this is written in the context of a group of people who knew what it was like to suffer, who knew what it was like to not get everything they wanted, who knew what it was like to live with pain and grief and sorrow, but now God has restored the fortunes. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. And then verse two, our mouths were filled with laughter, our our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. They're making this journey to meet with the living God. The God who gives them hope. The God who gives them life. They've known what it's like to be like Sarah. Perhaps they too had wandered from God. Perhaps, and this may be for some of us in the room today, They felt as though God had wandered from them. Ever felt that way? Like, God, I'm keeping the faith. I'm pressing on. I'm doing all the things the Bible tells me. And I feel like you're just distant. As though you've just wandered away.
I think we've all been there. And that's why the call back to joy and the call back to laughter and the call to remember what it is that God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ is so important. As the psalmist describes this, our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy because they're on this journey. And what are they doing is they're on this journey to meet with this God who is hospitable, to meet with this God who has said, I am the Lord, your God. I am the one who has a home for you. I am the one who has a space for you. I am the one who has a place for you. As they're making this journey, they're laughing. They're singing songs of joy because they recognize the goodness of God. And I don't want us to miss that. I don't want us to miss the blessing that comes from perhaps offering hospitality because you know what? You never know when God's going to show up at your dinner table. You never know when God's going to show up and you're having a cup of coffee with somebody. You never know when God's going to show up and you're just standing out here on the courtyard eating your scone and drinking your coffee, right? But I suspect you might have had a moment like that where all of a sudden there's just this burst of life and this burst of hope and this laughter. Just this laughter. I remember a couple of years ago, we had our elders, um, Shannon and I had the elders over at our house for, for a Christmas celebration. And, and, and Shannon was like, well, where, where do I go? Like, it's like, you guys are having this elder meeting and downstairs. And she said, so I'm just going to go upstairs and hang out upstairs. And when you all are done, I'll come down and, and have dinner with you. And, and so we got all done at the meeting and, 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 and you know, everybody went home and Shannon came, she was like, I've never thought there would be so much laughter in a meeting of the elders. But it was this great statement of saying there was so much to celebrate and so much goodness. And our elders are amazing. And there's, I mean, I am delighted the amount of laughter and joy that happens in our elder meetings. Because we've gathered. So hospitality, wrapping up. A couple of weeks ago, we said, we need, if we're going to spend six weeks talking about hospitality, there ought to be some sort of call to action to hospitality, right? Say yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. I always get a little nervous when it's just like, uh. So we're going to make this very simple. We do want to be a church that not just talks about having a generous and a gracious hospitality. We actually want to live that out. But to do that, we actually want your help. Like, we... The staff, we can't know everybody. We can't talk to everybody. We can't welcome everybody, but we can be strategic about that. So we're going to give you an opportunity um, after the sermon and after the Point Loma Singers do the postlude out on our upper courtyard. We have, it's a two-step thing. Okay. First of all, and then we got a slide up here, I think, to, to kind of drive the point home, putting hospitality into practice. Okay. So the first thing is this, you're going to have an opportunity to say, hey, I want to help do that. Because when we look at this campus, there are so many ways that people can get on and off this campus. There are people who shockingly can get on and off this campus and never even be greeted, right? Because maybe that's some of you in here today, right? You're like, eh, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be known. That's okay. I understand that. But we want to be good stewards of the space that God has given to us. So we're going to give you an opportunity to put hospitality into practice. Sign up on the upper courtyard and say, hey, I want to be a part of this. And then in two weeks, we're going to have an informational meeting because guess what's coming up at the very end of March? Easter. I know you were all thinking Easter, right? Because you're you're like, Easter in March. Yes, the 31st of March. Easter comes very, very, very quickly this year. But we have thousands of people on our campus. And we want to have that as like saying, we want to be welcoming and greeting and saying hi, and we're glad you're here. And not just on Easter, but anyway, so if you're interested in that, there's your call to action. Doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of energy, doesn't take a lot of effort. Don't tell me you're introverted and you can't do it. I'm an introvert, right? I know people don't believe that, but I am. And I love doing that because it, it, it gives me joy. Like it's this whole point of this last point I'm trying to make in this whole sermon is like, be hospitable because you will experience joy and laughter. So I'm going to end with one more point and then we're done. The very end of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, is one more word of encouragement to all of us about living hospitably. 
There are through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, verse 15, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget, here's this word again, do not forget. Have you forgotten? Right? Do not, I, I love how Hebrews is like twice in like 15 verses. Do not forget to do good and share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Do not forget to do good. You might just be surprised by what happens. That the Lord will just show up and you will experience this incredible joy, and this incredible laughter. Pray with me, please. Well, God, you are good. Your love endures forever. And we are a people who need to be reminded of that, that, God, you are always seeking out the stranger. You are always seeking out the foreigner. You are always seeking out the one who doesn't quite fit in. We see this in Jesus time after time after time after time. And yet, Lord, it's easy for us to just go back to the same people we know, the same group we always gather with, and then not really look out for those who might be new. So, Lord, open our eyes. Make this church the church we long to be, a church that practices a generous and gracious hospitality. Lord, we never know when you're going to show up, but we are always grateful when you do. So give us joy for the journey, and may our conversations be marked with laughter. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.